People, uh, they lack time because I think uh, many adults have lost their way. The world has a huge problem at the moment. So I think that it's up to music and the arts to make a stand and to make a move. Ik ga zo meteen Marina Maler interviewen. Zij is de kleindochter van Maler, de componist. Ze is echt iemand waar je goed mee over levensbeschouwelijke onderwerpen kunt praten. Ik heb ook veel vragen voorbereid, diepgaande vragen, dus uh, we zullen zien. Good afternoon, Mrs. Maler. Uh, it's my honor to interview you. And uh, thank you very much for accepting my interview. How do you think uh, music in general influences uh, people's lives? Uh, <laughs> I think that it's basic to people's lives because um, sound is basic and silence is basic. And I think the basis for music for me is always silence. And um, silence, it's as if one were suspended. And music is suddenly the movement and it's very often an emotional movement and all kinds of music have uh, effects on people whatever the music in whichever civilization uh, it's all and also people seem to need to create music it's as if nature the sounds of nature make people want to either sing or play the drum or the lute or a flute or make a stringed instrument it seems uh, to be a response to surroundings, to nature, I would think. So, isn't classical music just food for the happy few, for the elite? This is a very important question. And in fact, um, it's very relevant to, to my thoughts and to the reason why I made my Mahler Foundation. Because we are thinking to take Mahler beyond and um, meaning beyond the normal concert hall venue. Uh, we would like to see performances uh, in great open spaces where thousands of people, if they want, can come, uh, even stadiums and places where normally more popular uh, things happen, even rock music, football, the things which bring people together in huge numbers because I think that the, the classical music has, has become uh, very an elitist thing because first of all you have to be able to buy the ticket. The tickets are always expensive, even the cheapest of tickets. Yeah. And you have to make a choice. Everyone today has to make a choice. If you have a certain amount of money, what you're going to do with it. Now, because of YouTube and because of the internet, you can and streaming, you can hear uh, nearly every piece of music by yourself with earphones uh, through your computer or through your iPhone, whatever. And uh, also people, uh, they lack time. Yeah. They lack so, time. Yeah. You need time yeah. to listen to long pieces of music. And um, unless you're traveling and have earphones and, you know, you're going in, in the, the underground or you're going on a bus or you're going on your way somewhere or in a car. I, I listen a lot to music when I'm driving long distances by myself. But I think it's a very bad thing. And very recently, um, we have been thinking that we want to, we want to encourage uh, conductors of all ages, whether it's youth orchestras or big orchestras, to do uh, programming outside the normal concert hall. And um, so I'm hoping that there will be an interesting project coming up in maybe Avignon, Orange, in these very, very big uh, possible spaces. There's an arena in Orange. And I've been talking uh, with the people on the board and the uh, director of the Vienna Opera, because we have our board meetings there. Exactly about that. It's very, very important to to take it out because 
in the in the concert halls, I hear complaints by the people who run the the halls that usually it's people who are fifty years old and over o- older. Yeah. The young people they're doing something else. They need to do something else. They have no time. They want to hear this, and they if they get together, they want it to be very festive. You know, so we'll go to a rock concert. They'll all be together, and they can dance, and they get. So I think we need to. Um, I want to take Mahler into that area. I'd like it to be the joy of, be, of sharing with a huge amount of people uh, a wonderful experience. Yeah. I think that uh, music and the arts should be uh, there for for, pe- for people uh, that when they can feel they can access this, that they can do that. And um, we're having uh, the, the world has a huge problem at the moment. You have. As we know, there is the one percent who have all the money, and then all the rest of the people have only what's left. The poorer people are getting poorer, the richer are getting richer, and it's leading to social unrest, upset, extremism of all kinds. Yeah. So I think that it's up to music and the arts to make a stand and to make a move, a first move. You know, but do you think that the teenagers and uh, will also go to all the stadiums to listen to classical music? Because now they're not very interested. In I know. You know what I have wanted to do. I've reached out to the Pink Floyd, and I also have a, a very close friend who is uh, he's a uh, he's a rock star, but he's also written two operas. I mean, um, Rufus Wainwright. He's absolutely amazing singer and performer um, because I wanted to try to take Mahler into music festivals just to see the reaction where you have a stage set and you have people wandering in and out and going from and it's lasting all night and you know like a marathon a Mahler marathon I'd like to try this approach out because you have to reach out to young people. I mean, young people like this wonderful young Swedish girl who is 16 and who has started by herself something. And you have all the children the world over marching for the planet. And I think that the music I would like to do has to accompany her and the young people who are thinking purely and clearly because I think uh, many adults have lost their way. They are not living up to what is necessary, what is needed. So I think there is a big upheaval coming and uh, I think music and the arts have to play their share in this upheaval, in this challenging of what shouldn't be anymore. But isn't classical music then losing its um, like its meaning because all the people are not listening very carefully, but just walking around, and then the whole idea of listening to a big Mahler piece? I think gone. that um, the piece has to reach out and embrace uh, the people. I think that uh, it doesn't lose its meaning, uh, even in the most intimate parts of the sound of the symphony, because. You never know who is listening, and you always have to give credit to people for hearing. If they've never heard something before, I mean, there's a wonderful story that uh, Gilbert Kaplan, he was a finance person, and he uh, founded Institutional Investor, a magazine for finance, and fell in love one day, very young, with Mahler's Second Symphony. And he decided he, he went crazy for it. He decided he wanted to conduct it. So he hired a conductor to teach him how to conduct it. He started in Carnegie Hall. I was invited for the first concert years and years ago. It was him and, and Donald Mitchell, uh, who is a Mahler scholar, and, and uh, Lenny Bernstein. And we were the three, we were the patrons of this first. And then he did it all over the world, etc., etc. And he told me a story that a friend of his had taken a plane in America and was with earphones, it was sitting there with earphones, listening to the second symphony. Next door to him was the time of the punk, was a young woman with 
you know, all the punk extreme exactly as it was in those days. And she said to him, what group are you listening? What group are you listening to? Thinking it was rock. And he said, well, just listen. So he handed her the, uh, the earphones and um, half an hour later, she was sobbing. She had never heard any classical music. She, all the black makeup was coming down. She was sobbing because it hit her so hard. I think that there are some music you don't need any preparation. You don't need any education. You need just to listen. And that's the point of music. That it's not... Uh, you don't need to be an intellectual. You don't need to have studied the background of music or the history. You go to it directly and it comes directly to you. It touches the heart and that's why it's so important. Um, something else? Um, do you think that classical music can mobilize a political message um, like what often is used with pop music? I hope so, because what I want to do yeah. with the Mahler Foundation. But do you really want to give out a political message? I want to give out a humanistic message. I think that uh, uh, reversing uh, the the damage done already to the seas and the land and the bees and, you know, the pesticides and the plastics and whatever. Reversing this, I don't find political. It should go beyond the political parties. It is a necessity. It's a human necessity to... to we depend on nature. We won't exist without it. And uh, not enough is known about the balance of nature and what uh, the fact that the bees are being destroyed, they pollinate. We won't have food. Um, because the seas will rise, there will be uh, a catastrophic talk about, uh, uh, you know, um, now uh, refugees and, and uh, migrants. It, there will be huge populations migrating and there will be such poverty and insurances will not be able to pay for it. So. This is not political, as far as I'm concerned. This is essential. And I think that music must now get in and touch people. And that's why I, uh, we will be giving a Mahler Award, and we will be giving a Mahler Forum. And our subject is the Song of the Earth, the piece written by Mahler. And we are inviting various people uh, to talk about this uh, from different parts of life, parts of the uh, scientists, uh, a filmmaker, artist, and so, to, and then we want to stream this out as far and wide as we can. So I don't think that's politics. Politics is nearer to the ground, and it's what, uh, you know, take a look at it now in the world. It's a, it's a misery. Uh, it's it's a, a disaster. But do you think it's essential that um, everyone listens to classical music? I think it's essential that people listen to all music, which makes them react and happy. I think that certain kinds of classical music, depending on the performance, reach deeper. But I think the song in itself is a huge thing. There isn't a person alive who hasn't been moved by a song or a series of songs while growing up. And they stay with you all your life because you sing them and they are pa it's part of a certain epoch in your life. I think the song is very, very powerful. So pop music songs and... Also, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there are things that mean a huge amount to me. I love The Doors, for instance. The Doors are one of my favorite group from before because I like things that go... Like that. I don't like soft anything. <laughs> yes. Um, do you think classical music uh, has also been used in a wrong political context? Um, I think many things are used in wrong ways. I mean, are you thinking of Wagner and uh, sort of the whole anti-Semitic thing? It's difficult to say because um, art has been used and music has been used depending on who uses it. I mean, you have you have such a very simple thing such as marches. You know, marches are 
military and performed as such. And they are meant to give courage and energy of a certain kind to soldiers, young soldiers usually, going into war. And uh, that is a wrong use. To, to give courage to young people who are about to be killed and to kill others is wrong use of music. Yeah, uh, people say your grandfather's music reflects on his suffering in life. Um, do you agree with that? Only suffering in life. Yeah. Uh, no. Part, it bit. expresses huge suffering and huge joy. It expresses every single human emotion. That is why, um, I mean, I call it the Mahler effect, but that is why people are so passionate about it worldwide. It's it, because it touches them in every aspect of their being. I think it's all the emotions, not only the suffering. But he was very conscious of suffering. He would have liked that nobody suffers. I think he would have liked that his music um, cured the suffering of people. And I think very often he delves very deeply so that people listening, the, it's um, they can take this journey with him without having to do it alone, which is difficult and dangerous and and risky always for every human being. But he keeps company for the deepest of journeys into the self. Beautiful. Um, mm -hmm. Do you think his music can alleviate the suffering of others now? Yes. That's why I made yeah. the Mahler Foundation. And I think that's an important thing to do. Too many people are suffering. From what? Oh, too many wars, too many, too much, uh, too much poverty, too much upset. There's not enough care taken of people. Everybody wants, uh, you know, it's every, each person for himself. We will come into a bit of a selfish time, and that's. It's terrible, but it's also dangerous, yeah. because if people forget that uh, we are all part of uh, this extraordinary adventure of being on this earth. I mean, if you imagine it, it's crazy. We're spinning uh, through the, you know, through space, and here we have uh, all these continents with millions of people. It's not crazy. It's up to us to take care of everyone else. And it's up to us to take care of the nature, which is this wonderful balance. It's a miracle, really. We have no right to either destroy it or destroy other people. And somehow, civilization will happen only when we know this and realize it and make it make it reality. We are not yet a civil. We're not yet civilized. For example, Shostakovich, he composed for the Russian people and in a time where uh, they suffered enormous hardship. Does your grandfather's music did something like this as well? I think so because in a way I feel that he may have anticipated the troubles coming. He died before the First World War. When you think back to the world before the First World War, it was another world. And the, the damage that was caused by the First World War, I always think that the art that came afterwards, it's because there was so much bloodshed and so much uh, violence and so that, that people so couldn't bear it that they had to go to the abstract. They couldn't face the human form anymore uh, because they had to abstract it and um, leave it, so to speak, to be able to maybe come back later. But it was... A world war is quite an immense thing, and th everybody says that was the real one because it was the first one. And so many people died. I mean, it was, you know, something horrendous. So... I feel that he composed uh, all of this music for, for the future. He said, my time will come. Unfortunately, there were two world wars, and um, things are not very good at the moment. But people reach out to him, and his music, for instance, when 
uh, Kennedy, the President of the United States, was killed, assassinated. Um, Leonard Bernstein conducted the Resurrection Symphony in his honor to commemorate him. When Bobby Kennedy was killed, he conducted the slow movement from the fifth. Um, I think wherever there have been big things to commemorate, they have taken Mahler's music because it expresses uh, grief, memory, it expresses love for the... Uh, it, it, uh, it seems to say what needs to be said. In the music? Yes, in the music. Does music bond men in nature? Yes. That's a lovely question. I think it does. I think it does. But I always think music is an expression of nature. I think all art is an expression also of nature. If you just listen to the wind and you see uh, trees moving with the branches and you dance. And I think, uh, yes, I think it's, um, it's a direct outcome from the visible nature and the invisible nature. <laughs> the inner nature and the outer nature the nature of the world and the nature of the human being. Can music be an agent for a dialogue between people? Yes, because it... it, 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 it yes, I think, I think so. Um, it's like, you know, a counterpoint anyway is a dialogue. And I think that, um, first of all, because it goes beyond any boundaries. There are no boundaries in music. The boundary is the ear and the listening ear. There is nothing else. And the listening ear has infinity as a boundary because the human brain, listening, mind, has no limits. Yeah, thank you very much. You're welcome. It, there are wonderful questions. I don't think I've ever had a, a, a better interview. Really? <laughs> yeah, really. Because I've had a lot, a lot of interviews, but your questions were very interesting. Thank you. And interesting to answer. I had to ask myself, you know. Yeah. Very good. Thank you.